Afternoon, everybody. Nice to be here. Um, I uh, run two programmes with NHS England that are slowly morphing into being one programme called Code for Health. Uh, the original name of the programme was the NHS Open Source Programme. So hands up if anybody knew the NHS had an open source programme. Some people in the room. Uh, but you can hear me, hear me anyway. Am I on? That better? Yes? Okay. Um, so the open source programme in the NHS uh, started probably two years ago. Um, it was a running for about six months before I came along. I came to NHS England um, 18 months ago for three months and ended up staying. Um, my background before that is in uh, local government transformation, IT, business process redesign, etc. Et um, so I came into it uh, just at the end of a, a, a range of uh, across US political level trips where a lot of people have been over to say the Vista APR system. And so was born the NHS Open Source Programme. Um, luckily, um, the organisation decided against taking a piece of code which was quite old um, and trying to make it ready for the NHS and spending several million pounds of it on it. And so the programme became uh, a lot broader. And the first thing I just want to go through is the why uh, an open source programme within the NHS. So I know I'm speaking to an educated audience here about open source, so I'll not labour too, too many of these points, but the first bullet point I think is quite common across, definitely across the public sector, in terms of IT and systems that we expect um, staff to use, whether they are doctors, nurses, social workers, planners, so on and so forth. Huge issues, huge issues about usability of that software and how usable that software is. Uh, third bullet point, um, these are all comments, by the way, that were made to me when I came to NHS England from clinical staff. Didn't come as a great surprise to us, but these aren't my words. Um, third bullet point in terms of you could have a, be having a discussion with a group of clinicians that may have in, invented this great new <coughs> business process or new care pathway that's a lot, lot safer for their patients, but unable to implement it because they either can't get the software changed at all, or the cost of changing it is prohibitive, or the vendor just decides that they don't want to change it because it's proprietary software. Fourth bullet point, increasingly, um, software, uh, particularly APRs, electronic patient records, are being viewed by the clinicians as medical devices, just as much as an infusion pump is that's running a piece of software that controls what drugs are being, uh, being administered, because they're making decisions based on the data in those, um, in those systems. And there is a growing body uh, of, of thought that actually, rather than the old adage of security through obscurity in terms of transparency of the software code, then it's better to have safety through scrutiny, so the thousand pairs of eyes, et cetera, et cetera. I'll not tell you the full story of the would you trust your life to software that you cannot see, but that's a quote from a lady who runs the um, New York Open Source Software Observatory. Some of you may know her. She's got a device fitted in her chest, heart stops every now and then, device detects it, gives a little electric shock, heart starts up again. She wanted to see the code. She wanted other people to see the code. You had to see if it was safe. She's still in a legal battle, as far as I'm aware, in terms of trying to get to see that code. Um, she hasn't got to see the code yet, but she did manage to get a room full of people together in a hack and stop and start the device using the Wi-Fi connection on her iPhone, which obviously was a bit of a shock to her. Um, the last bullet point in terms to give us a fighting chance, they are my words, um, is we try to move towards this nirvana of integrated digital care records and seamless transfer of information through the health and social care economy, I mean just seamless transfer through one bit of the health economy uh, would be a start, then there are a range of variables and factors in that about why that can happen or it can't happen. Um, a lot of it's culture, a lot of it is where particular economies are in their maturity. Some of it's just down to how well the IT manager in that organisation gets on with that IT manager in this organisation. 
but at least with open source we can be we, we can remove some of the commercial vested interests that exist that stop interoperability happening um, and also gives us a, a much easier uh, model to be able to join these systems up going forward because obviously for obvious reasons um, this is what we're trying to achieve a bit of a grandiose or vision statement uh, the self-sustaining ecosystem what we're trying really hard to do what I'm trying really hard to do is that um, government organizations start up programs and they continue for a period of time sometimes it's a long time sometimes a very short amount of time but you those programs are basically at political behest in terms of whether they continue to be funded whether they go on whether they come to a grind and halt so what we're really trying to do is to make this thing as self-sustaining as possible yeah that it isn't actually beholden to a single government agency or organization to say yes we're doing this or oh, we would really like to do this but we can't afford to do it anymore yeah so we're trying to get to a place where this is completely self-sustaining so in terms of what we're doing is the, the program is now morphing into what's being called code for health so some of you may have heard that term before it's been kicking around for a couple of years uh, it's sort of based on the code for america model if people are aware of that which is ma mainly in the more municipal municipality state of local government you couldn't have local government here um, and there are four elements although there's three elements shown on this slide um, communities which is where a lot of the open source communities and products and projects sit of which we've got a significant number of communities working on and developing open source healthcare clinical systems yeah we're not operating in the commodity space here yeah we're not about operating systems we're about open source clinical systems electronic prescribing systems electronic patient records um, the learning element is a syllabus that we're putting together to um, let people say what the art of the possible is in terms of the development of technology and what you can do with modern technology modern technology tool sets and in particular open source yeah within healthcare in particular we're coming out of a, a period of a national program where basically innovation just stagnated yeah very strong commercial reasons if you were an IT company and you weren't subcontracted to one of the LSPs you had no market to sell your product to and if you were an LSP why would why would you innovate you've won this contract for this period of time to deliver these things that you've got where's the driver there to innovate so there's a there's a learned behavior really particularly amongst clinical staff that to do anything with IT in the healthcare social care sector it's really difficult it's really expensive it takes a long time I'm gonna have a real battle on my hands to get this done get this developed and get it in use and we we we've had 150 200 clinicians uh, through our snappily entitled build a healthcare app in a day course which uses a uh, we're not great at PR and marketing uh, which uses a, a open source development environment and in the morning they come in and they replicate the little calculator that they've got on their on their phone or on their iPhone or on their Android phone and in the afternoon they build a healthcare app yeah peak flow monitor uh, to measure people's peak flow, uh, accesses various um, clinical knowledge sets on an app, just so they can see the art possible. Yeah, this is not about getting doctors to build new IT systems for healthcare and then they're going to be in production use. Yeah, this is prototyping and the art of the possible under the learning piece. Challenge: Then the SMAs in the room, you might be interested in this. We're currently running three or four challenges at the moment where we are looking for people to come up with innovative ideas in particular spaces submit them to us um, and the prize is not you know 500 quids worth of amazon vouchers or whatever it is the prize is that we will commission it to be built and release it and try and get people to use it yeah so we want um, ideas input from 
our communities, which I've talked, which I've talked briefly about, as well as product-based communities, we have place-based communities um, that are looking at various particular issues that are relevant to them. But it's really a coming together of SMEs, designers, UX, UI, clinicians, yeah. And I'm particularly keen to address the non-health and social care IT supplier market, yeah because we can provide the doctors and the clinicians that will tell you what this stuff needs to do. What we're looking for is really good software engineering, really good use of open source frameworks yeah, to develop these things. <coughs> so that's under the challenge piece. I'll come on to that a little bit more if I've got time, but I do tend to talk. Uh, the third element on the diagram is platform. Uh, and this is a, uh, a sand pit <coughs> environment a test and dev sand pit environment. And basically the, the, the criteria is anybody out there who has got um, a piece of health or social care software or interoperability software that would fit into that space, they'd say that open source or open, we will register it on the platform to allow people to build new applications. Yeah. And the only criteria is that you can only do that in a test and development environment. You obviously can't use this for production strength stuff because of the confidentiality issues. But for example, uh, we had a, it's probably best to illustrate this through example. We had a small SME, two, three person SME, who had come up with a new little uh, piece of software that would print uh, prescription labels in a second language. Yeah, by law, they've got to be printed in English first, but not everybody can read English in terms of what's on the medicine bottle and what's on the side of the box. So they had this, but they couldn't test it. You know, how, how do we get hold of a, an e-prescribing system and a pharmacy system that we can test this against? Yeah? So what we're doing is we're putting all of the APIs on there, all of the national APIs, including things like the spine, um, uh, um, APS and all of the big systems so that at a point you'll be able to come along and if you develop something you'll be able to test it against all those APIs and other bits of infrastructure. GP systems that are out there in the community already. Electronic patient record systems that are out there in the community already. Yeah? Um, knowledge bases such as FDB. So FDB produce effectively the knowledge base of all drugs that's in use within the UK and the different interactions those drugs have with each other. There is a free to use test and dev license of FDB on that platform that anybody can use free of charge. So it's all about the innovation in terms of the platform. The fourth element, I'm using quite an old, oldish slide set here because I'm trying to condense as much as I can in the, in the 15, 20 minutes to allow time for questions and discussion. The fourth um, element uh, of the of Code for Health is around supporters. Yeah, Code for Health supporters. So these are generally IT organisations who've said, we understand what you're trying to do here. We understand trying to get these communities of people together, like-minded individuals, to solve these problems. Um, and we would like to help with that and make some kind of a contribution. Yeah. So these are, for example, organisations who have provided their software free of charge and APIs to it on the platform. Others, um, these have been a bit of a re revelation, uh, Microsoft, in terms of uh, definitely uh, going in a particular way. Uh, they have a, an open source team at Microsoft and a head of open source at Microsoft. And actually, they've provided... Um, quite a lot of Azure cloud computing time to us, free of charge, that are then used by some of the communities who are developing new solutions. And um, actually the Core for Health platform um, and our open source CRM that we use um, all run on Linux servers, Linux VMs running on Microsoft Azure. And what we see here on this board, and this is quite out of date now and I probably could fill this screen three times over, um, these, are these are not your traditional legacy healthcare IT providers that have dominated over the period of the national programme. <coughs> Lots of these are organisations who have been locked out of the UK health market space because of the national programme, because they weren't contracted to deliver things. And they're starting to come back now 
with innovations that they've had in Europe and other parts of the world and saying, well, we've got this over here that works fine in this part of Eastern Europe. You might want to consider looking at that for the NHS. And of course we are. <coughs> Another interesting thing about this slide is that there are a number of vendors on here who all use the same open standards data model. Yeah, because it's all very well being open source in terms of the code. But actually, the jewel in the crown is an open standard data model that everybody can interact with. So that this app, if it's written to this standard, will work with a number of platforms. And then competing apps can come along and work to the same platform and standard, given, I think, what will be the first time true choice. So regardless of even a vendor lock-in and be, being able to eliminate vendor lock-in with open source, actually the ability to the software suppliers to fight it out on quality of service and how good the product is. You know, I don't have to use this app to book a GP appointment just because my GP has this back-end GP system and therefore this is the only app I can use. Yeah? We want to get everything onto, a same, onto the same common platform. This is um, just trying to um, illustrate how the whole thing hangs together and almost a pathway about how they, these things happen. We've got some quite cool little animations. I don't know if people are familiar with Powtoons. We discovered Powtoons a while ago and the team just keep knocking out these Powtoons animations now to, to articulate things. We've got some great ones, particularly about Odonto. So these are just four examples of communities, open source product communities that are under the program. So this is uh, open source electronic prescribing. Yeah, obviously wanted to set ourselves a bit of a challenge. What's the riskiest thing you can do? Let's build an open source electronic prescribing system. Um, that's actually the basis of a product that was developed uh, for a children's hospital in Slovenia. And the organization then released the software open source to us, the community formed around it, and have been developing that solution going forward. Hopefully, if, um, if one of the home countries doesn't beat us to it, we'll be installed in a, in a trust in England um, spring, summer <coughs> next year. Huge, huge benefits around this project. And not just financial, um, but in terms of reducing harm and patient outcomes. Open AOBS, that's another community and product. That's around um, electronic observations of people. You know, you go to the hospital, you've got the clipboard bottom of the bed. So this is using tablet devices to take those observations. Then runs a series of algorithms which effectively red, amber, green the patient in terms of if an intervention needs to be made, uh, what the in intervention is that needs to be made. But it's effectively, it's a piece of workflow software. It's driving a process. Yeah, that's actually built on Odoo. I don't know if people are, fam people are familiar with Odoo. Uh, but the AORB solution is built on Odoo. Open Maxims, uh, first open source full electronic patient record went live yesterday in Taunton and Somerset. NHS Foundation Trust, full suite open source APR. You know, when I'm doing these talks to NHS trusts and the healthcare community and they go, what do you mean it's open source? I go, well, you can go and download it, look at it and implement it in your hospital. These are generally multi, 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 multi millions, million pound systems. Yeah. So the, the company behind Open Maxims, IMS Maxims, took a decision last summer to release their software on a JBL license. Completely changed their business model from one as being a product-based company to being a services-based company. There's the software, you can go and take it, use it yourself. If you'd like us to implement it for you, support it, uh, have a support contract with us, we're here, if you want to. And Odonto, the Odonto is a great um, story. Uh, that we've got the power tunes for. So this is down to the dedication and passion of a dentist and academic up in, uh, up in Newcastle, actually, um, who was just, you know, the thought about la lack of satisfaction with the systems that she was using. Just, I can't do my job. 
you know, if they were given any IT at all in the first place, to run community dental. So, went to one of our NHS hack days, spoke to a few people, saw how easy it was to prototype some web forms up, epiphany moment, let's get together, let's do something. So, really strong community around Odonto. There was a group of uh, clinicians, dentists, academics meet every Tuesday morning. They're busy doing all the requirements gathering. Uh, they formed a community interest company as the legal vehicle for the development of the software and um, they will be uh, commissioning the development of that open source community dental system and then it will be free to download for anybody in the world who wants to and there are a couple of um, so it's no good doing this if you haven't got a customer behind it who wants to download and take it in particular an NHS trust so there is uh, the clinicians are all from about four or five different NHS trusts who have put money in and we've grant it as well um, to seed fund it to build this thing and obviously they, they will be minded to implement that system across their trusts once it's ready to implement. So NHS, um, NHS trusts as you can imagine very very risk averse organisations rightly so um, but huge amount of myths around open source. I've, re I've pretty much heard everything from audiences and in discussions, you know. You know, just some things that you probably wouldn't believe in terms of, um, well, it's unsafe. Anybody can get in and change it. Really? Isn't that going to be running on your data centre in your organisation? Right next to the servers that's running your proprietary software. Yeah, so just, you know, amazing, really. Um, so we have developed this thing that we've called the NHS England Custodian Model. So just think what Red Hat is to Linux. Yeah, so the custodian is a not-for-profit community interest company, not-for-profit, non-dividend paying community interest company that um, effectively issues what we call the gold standard version of the code for use in the NHS. Yeah, so the custodian will say version 1.1 of OpenAP is the gold standard version of code to use in the NHS that's been through all the clinical safety testing, that's been, you know, assured to work with whatever. Yeah, and the idea is that all of the users of the software will join the community, pay a subscription fee, pull the money and get an economy of scale to buy what we would call custodianship technical services, another catchy name, um, which would effectively assure the trusts that there is um, support and maintenance and so on behind that distribution of the code. Yeah. It would also gather any contributions, any prototyping, any additional functionality, would be gathered and contributed to the custodian um, who would then make a decision about whether that enhancement <coughs> would be developed by professional software organisation and included in the next distribution of the software. Yep. Now obviously this is where the commercial model comes in for the commercial providers and organisations. Yeah. So in terms of the commercial model, there's two, two main revenue streams, really. One is, this isn't, this isn't about people getting together and writing software code production strength. Yeah, the community is about people getting together and prototyping and developing stuff and trying out new ideas. But then commissioning software development houses to develop the software for them. Yeah. So they will pay company X to build this thing to this specification using this tool set and the second element is for the um, commercial organizations to support ongoing professional services around the product so support implementation um, so on and so forth yeah so this is all about making that transition from being a product-based organisation, which most healthcare IT providers are, to become a services-based organisation. 
and providing a set of professional services around these open source assets. So IMS, for example, at the moment, provide a set of professional services around the open maxim suite, but are slowly moving into providing professional services around some of the other open source assets that the, that the communities are commissioning to be built. In terms of the, um, that custodian model, in about February this year, we, we, did a, we generated a spin-off company called the Open Source Software Foundation for Health and Care. So this is a clinically led autonomous organisation founded by uh, three, now four, leading clinicians and informaticians. So Professor Belial Wood out of Murfield's Eye Hospital, who's behind the Open Eyes Project, Dr Phil Corzan, who's got about 20 different jobs, um, Betty Wassell from the Odento, Odonto community, and uh, Joe MacDonald, Dr Joe MacDonald, who was chair of the CCIO network. So this, this organisation is going to be our main legal vehicle going forward. It's been grant aided by NHS England. It can receive contributions from other legal entities. Um, and it will act as that incubator custodian, especially when the products are very new until they're mature enough to spin off into their own community interest companies. And that's it. Yeah? Um, did it, it's a website, quoteforhealth.org. So if you go, oh, I'll tell you what, I can go there, I think. Aha. Uh, uh -huh. um, so, page around the platform, learn the community's challenges, supporters. You can apply to be a supporter. You can apply to take part in the challenges. Uh, you can apply to start up a new community around a particular interest if a community doesn't exist already because this is all about um, reducing duplication, doing things once and then iteratively improving it rather than having you know 50 communities out there dealing with cardiothoracic imaging or whatever it is that they want to do open source. Um, and in terms of opportunities coming up, there's obviously the opportunity around the challenges, but as these communities start to mature, what we will be doing is using this website and probably Twitter to ask to gauge level of interest in terms of, here's something that needs building. Who's interested in building this? And that will be a paid for. You will get real money to build it. Okay? <laughs>